Cool. All right. I think that will new people might pop in as we're uh, working through stuff, but we'll jump them in when they when they come on in. So, all right. Thanks everybody uh, for making it. Uh, Again, what we're going to do is just spend the next hour uh, going through uh, addressing questions that you all have in terms of content, stuff that's uh, uh, from the book, from lecture. Uh, it's all fair game. So anything that you uh, would like addressed or additional examples or clarification on stuff, I will jump through and do that. Um, so I guess open the floor to you all. Um, and sort of get questions. So I had a uh, question regarding, um, like how the pulse of one movement led to the other. Okay. One. Yeah. 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 Daniel, uh, fantastic. Um, so here, let me, I'm going to go through and share this screen here. All right, and just go through and uh, talk about. So the idea is, uh, and my recommendation was, in trying to keep these straight. Uh, people give me a shout out if they're having a hard time keeping these movements straight in their head. No, you guys are all clutch. All right. <laughs> so take your silence to mean you got this all under control. Um, okay, uh, but it is one of these with these history and systems kind of hard to keep things uh, sort of straight. So what you want to do, Daniel, is remember that structuralism, again, structuralism, this is our first movement in psychology. These folks, these were the folks who uh, said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take psychology out of the realm of philosophy, right? And we're going to turn this into a science, something that we can go through and actually study. So it's not just sort of what I'm thinking and logical arguments for how uh, mind works or how we learn or things along those lines. We're going to take this and sort of make this an objective area. This is a new um, field of study and we're going to call it psychology. And so again, what structuralism was interested in, remember that these are the folks who were really, really influenced by hard sciences. So chemistry, biology, and the idea was what we want to do is we want to take consciousness and figure out what are the basic building blocks of consciousness. What are the atoms of the mind? What are like the sort of the foundational components of uh, sort of people's sort of psychological experience? Okay. And so uh, this is where uh, these folks got into uh, introspection, sort of the idea that the only people who can uh, report on their experiences of the person who's having that experience. But again, the goal here was to break it down and sort of like think about this as like a, a periodic table of consciousness, right? So we've got affective, affection, sensations, things along those lines, right? And so this is really what uh, the structuralists were really interested in, okay? But then what we've got is we've got the functionalists. Structuralists going on in Germany. Functionalists uh, started up in the in the U.S., super uh, influenced by Darwin and the functionalists are saying like, I don't care what it's made of. Who cares? Like I don't, the egghead stuff in the lab where you're trying to like repeatedly measure things. What we should be focused on is what psychology does. What are uh, these capacities um, and how do they help us survive? So a very, very Darwin kind of motivated thing. So why do we think, why do we read, why do we hang out in groups? Uh, why do we develop uh, emotional bonds to other people? Like these things that we see human beings do, how do they keep us, how do they help us survive? How do they go through uh, and keep us from getting eaten or die of exposure and things like that? And so uh, what James and the functionalists started to do is instead of just having things be very, very uh, sterile experiments within the lab, like the structuralists, what they started going out and doing is observing people, having people fill out surveys, right? Using this comparative method, starting watching animals and how animals interact and people interact and kids. Remember that uh, structuralism, the participants were graduate students and professors sort of introspecting on their own stuff. Functionalism took this out in the world and said, hey, what we want to do is look at the function of behavior and start to develop hypotheses about this stuff. Okay. And so this was 
sort of a big, big shift in the, the, the focus of what people thought psychology should be about. Then we get into Freud. Freud's a little bit of a, of a disconnect here because Freud was kind of doing his own thing, right? Freud was a, neuro, uh, a neurologist, a medical doctor in Vienna. And what Freud was doing is had a practice, had people come in who are uh, struggling with depression, anxiety, behavioral difficulties. They're doing stuff to sabotage their own lives and making poor decisions and things along those lines, seeing impulsivity, um, you know. And so what Freud was doing is he was working with these folks started to put together a model of personality and a model of uh, human nature and, and psychotherapy to try and understand why people were doing the things that he was doing and seeing in, uh, within the context of his practice. And so Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, started to put together this idea of unconscious drives, uh, these life instincts, these death instincts that are driving behavior. Again, big, big focus on the unconscious, right? And so again, Freud's approach was his, his work was to try and understand why are people coming in? Why am I seeing the same types of things in sort of different forms and different people? And so his clinical work informed his model of human behavior, personality, things like that. Okay. And this was a huge deal, right? This was, this was a, a, a big deal. Freud, a lot of interesting ideas, um, not all of them super supported by science. Like the things he was, the observation, observations that he was making are real. You can't argue that like some people sort of have sort of defense mechanisms and things like that. And these are behaviors that people engage in. It's just his explanation for them. Sort of the underlying mechanisms, probably not so great, right? So Freud, uh, Freud's taken off. Everybody's big, uh, sort of Freud's the new fad, uh, until we get into like the seventies, sixties, seventies. And so you've got a group of researchers who are tired of this whole unconscious business and these unconscious drives. It's all kind of mystical and it starts it's starting to get back into this whole philosophy thing. They're not stuff that we can see that we can test directly. Um, yeah, Freud, uh, his theory will uh, hypothesize seven different outcomes based on the same originating circumstances. They're saying this isn't science. What we need to focus on is observable behavior. And so the behaviorists are looking at uh, just basically learning things. So classical conditioning, operant conditioning, stimulus response types of stuff. And for the behaviorists, they're saying a reaction to psychoanalysis in that if I can't see it, it's not worth studying. So your id construct is stupid because I can't see id. I can't see ego. I can't see life instincts and death instincts. What I can do is I can say if I get if I reinforce you for some behavior, that is makes that behavior more likely to occur. If I punish a behavior, it makes that behavior less likely to to occur. And so what we want to do, and what the behaviorists are saying, is we need to focus on observable behavior. If I can't see it, it's not worth including in my theory of how the world works. Okay, so behaviorism huge huge influence. Right. Um, but eventually you've got the humanists coming in and the humanistic psychology perspective. This this movement is saying basically you had folks who were tired of uh, psychoanalysis with their mystical magic drives and the behaviorists who only wanted to look at uh, observable behavior. Um, the humanistic psychologists are saying, what about human will, free will, strengths and things like that? Right. Because remember that uh, psychoanalysis and behaviorism. Very, very, very different theories, but both very deterministic in their view of human behavior. Psychoanalysis, everything's based on your unconscious drives. Behavior, every, behaviorism, everything's based on your learning experience, right? Um, and so if I can't see it, so like free will is not a real thing in psychoanalysis and radical behaviorism. Humanistic uh, psychologists said that's garbage. People do have free will. What about the things that make people great, that uh, get people to strive and achieve uh, in things along these lines, right? And so they're a much stronger po focus on uh, things like uh, uh, self-actualization and relationships, how people go through and grow. Uh, and so uh, gave birth to the humanistic movement, not as strong as an influence on psychological science, but huge in counseling psychology and sort of appropriately placing an emphasis on things, some things that were being not attended to in psychoanalysis and uh, radical behaviorism. And then the last uh, uh, condition or movement we come to is the cognitive psychologists in like the 70s. Again, these were behaviorists, 
who've been working in behaviorism long enough. Behaviorism does a lot of good stuff, but at the end of the day, you kind of hit, you kind of run out of room to explain things with just your learning history. There's other stuff that goes in. If it was all learning history, we could perfectly predict behavior, but we can't perfectly be predict behavior, not by a long shot. And so what the cognitive psychologists were interested in, so what's going on up here? Like to say that we don't have minds and we don't think and sort of have sort of emotions and things like that, is starting to get a little, bit, a little bit nonsensical. And so what the cognitive psychologists are doing is they're starting to go through and thinking about your covert mental processes, your thoughts and your feelings as a form of behavior. They're just behaviors that we can't sort of see necessarily, right? So I don't know, uh, Maya's in my screen right now, right? There's things going through her head right now that I can't see, but I'm not saying that she's not behaving. There's definitely things going on. It's just not a blank, empty space, right? And so what the cognitive psychologists are saying is we're interested in what's going on in your head and what we can start to do through different types of observable behaviors, reaction times, some self-report, some experimental studies that we can start to get at what's going on in your head, even though we can't see it sort of directly. And so what we see with the cognitive psychologists is starting to get back into some of the things that some of the topics that really started psychology off in the first place, this idea of how do we understand sensations and personal experience and reaction times and perception and stuff like that, coming back around a much better way of going through and a much more sophisticated, sophisticated way of studying it with the cognitive psychologists relative to the structuralists and thinking about things a little bit different. Cognitive psychology isn't saying, oh, we've got the atoms of the mind. They're just like, no, we see things, we hear things, we think things. What are the processes related to that? And so sort of taking a different approach, but some links back to sort of that uh, original founding fathers types of stuff. Okay. So that's kind of in a 10 minute nutshell. Sort of all of this kind of blink bringing this together. Uh, Daniel, does this help kind of clarify that in your mind? Yeah, it did help. Okay, cool, cool. Anybody else have questions about um, any of these movements, uh, any aspects, relative strengths, criticisms, anything like that? Um, I did have uh, one question. Yeah. Um, what were the methods of studying in structuralism? Okay, so the, the, the techniques in structuralism, uh, this is going to be introspection, okay? Again, this idea is, again, Jaden, what I'm going to do if I'm a structuralist, right? I want to know what the basic building blocks of consciousness. And so if I've decided that sensation is a, um, is a basic building block, what I might do, and so let's say I'm your prof I'm a professor and you're my graduate student, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and maybe show you a bunch of different colors, right? And I'm going to show you all different shades. And what I'm going to do with this introspection technique is I'm going to have you describe to me what you're seeing, what your experience is. I want you to describe this color to me, but don't use color words, okay? So you can't say green, blue, gray, because that's not helpful. Because you know what? It's possible that the way you see green is a completely different than the way I see green. We just call the both, we both call it green. And so if we say, oh yeah, that's a green, it seems like we're in agreement, but our ex actual experience of it is completely different. So what I want you to do is I want you to describe this square to me, not using color words, right? This is a hard thing to do, right? And I'm not just going to ask you to do this once. I'm going to ask you to do this over and over and over and over again in different settings when sort of sometimes maybe it's when you're super tired, maybe some other times when it's when you're wide awake, um, you know, and sort of varying this up to try and get a sense for how your brain is processing this thing. Okay. Now the problem with that is that if you, all right, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, Jaden, what, give me a descriptor of, of, of this square that doesn't involve color words. Okay, you're, you're flirting on the edge, but that's fine. I'll give you dark. Anything else? Okay, maybe, maybe I, I might say, uh, so this is this is cool. Like it's a, I, this is a cool color that um, feels. I don't know. 
yeah, something like that, right? And so you're, so you're starting to go through, and, and so maybe I say, yeah, sure, I don't know. Anybody, anybody uh, uh, a fan of, anybody uh, a wine connoisseur or a whiskey connoisseur or something like that? Any sommeliers in, in the audience today? No, okay, you're undergrads. You don't have sort of disposable income for fine wines and whiskeys and so on and so forth. But if you had someone like sort of, you got, I got a wine, right? And I'm, I'm sort of swirling it and I taste it. I'm like, oh, this, uh, I'm tasting this, I'm tasting this. None of it's a wine alcohol words, right? But it's a way of describing something sort of that's not just like, oh, it tastes like wine, right? Kind of the same thing here. But um, if Daniel says, oh, I feel like this, I'm getting a lot of, earth in this wine. I say, I don't think that's right. That seems off base, right? There's really no way to connect those two, right? And this is the problem with introspection. Um, from the approach, it makes sense. And they're trying to make this an objective science and sort of with repetition, they're doing the best job that they can, but some problems in terms of sort of the extent to which people are able to verbalize and sort of accurately report their own experience. And then also sort of if I have discrepancies between, you know, people's experience, it's hard to say, well, your experience is that of this is right and yours is wrong. And so some limitations there. So that's the primary method of structuralism, which again, as we go through, it's easy to criticize. Um, but at the time, if you're first starting out, it's a, it's a good shot. You know, you're in the right direction. You're not probably where we need to be eventually, but so sort of that's where we are right now too. So. Other questions on uh, any of the historical figures uh, portion of the lecture? I have a question. Yeah. Could you go over the case studies part of psychoanalysis, like an example or something? Yeah. All right. So tell me what a case study is. Um, oh. Nope, go ahead, Bib. Like something extraordinary about them or different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And generally today when we see case studies, that's generally what it is. It's someone who's got kind of a unique type of situation. Something that we couldn't get a whole bunch of people and evaluate just because there's not that many people who have it. Right. Now, we can extend case studies out to just like an in-depth evaluation of just uh, an individual. And this was really how Freud built his theory right? Because remember, Freud was a practicing physician, and he's got people coming in with interesting things or interesting perspectives or interesting difficulties. And he's, you start to see similarities across individuals and some differences, but you start to see common themes. And what Freud started to do based on all of these case studies, right? And each patient was an individual case study. He starts to develop an idea about how people work in general. Okay, so again, some of the and what this does is it leads to some interesting and probably not terribly on point uh, hypotheses about basic human functioning. Okay, so one of the things and we'll talk about this later on, not a whole lot because we won't spend a lot of time on Freud, but this idea of of Oedipus complex. Um, anybody know what Oedipus complex refers to from psychoanalysis, Freudian stuff? Okay, this is from a from a classic Freudian perspective. Oedipus complex refers to as men our inherent drive to kill our fathers and marry our mothers because deep inside we have a sexual uh, desire for our mothers because they're an attachment person, right? And this was part of Freud's theory. He said basically, like, but obviously no one wants to say yeah, I want to sleep with my mom and kill my dad, right? This is something in Freud's mind that's pushed way, way down. And for women, it's the electro complex. It's the opposite. You want to kill your mom and run off with your dad type of thing. Uh, but the idea is like, what we do is we push this down so far, but really if I'm having a conflict with my, with my dad because of something, and so I'm in, in Freud's couch and I'm saying, boy, you know, my dad's really on my case. 
and he's never supported me and and you know he's really stressed in my life you know freud maybe says oh yeah this is evidence of so what it's actually is you actually want to kill your dad because he's married to your mom and you really want your mom and so all this conflict is based on your desire to sleep with your mom right it's a weird thing made sense to freud at the time but what what is going through is sort of basing sort of broad understandings and broad hypotheses about how people in general work based on a few individuals, a handful of individuals, a handful of case studies of folks who aren't probably aren't functioning so well. They're having their struggles. And so the concern with doing this is one of generalization, right? Um, if I've got someone who's really struggling in a lot of domains, is their experience generalizable to everybody? I don't know. Maybe in some cases it is, maybe it's not. But also these uncontrolled studies, <clears throat> Freud's not doing systematic, like empirical work. He's uh, he's going through, taking notes, sort of making his own impression. So there's a big concern with confirmation bias with Freud's stuff. So basically Freud's got an idea that really deep inside all of us, we have a desire to sleep with the opposite sex parent. And so if that's what I think, as people start coming in and talking with me, maybe I start picking things out that to me are evidence of that, when in fact it's it's not, it's just other stuff going on, but that's how I'm interpreting it. Viv, does that help sort of clarify some of the some of the problems, at least from a scientific standpoint, that we would have with psychoanalysis? Yes, thank you. Cool. Other questions? Either with the historical figures or any of the, the, the research method stuff. I have another question. Yeah. When it mm -hmm. comes to like, the correlation, yeah. Um, will there be questions, or is it like probable to think there'll be questions like asking us to estimate the correlation? In, like <laughs> example graph. No, 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 no. I won't ask you to estimate a correlation for for correlation. Um, know what a correlation coefficient is, what a positive correlation is, what a negative correlation is. Sort of kind of what what they mean. How do we determine? strength and magnitude of a correlation. How do we, how do we know with uh, the strength of an association based on our correlation coefficient? Um, like based off of the number? Yeah. If it's like positive or negative. Okay, can you be more specific? Um, if it's closer to one. There you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. As we start to get closer to the ends, right? A correlation of uh, as it, as the number gets closer and closer to positive one or negative one indicates a stronger association. Things towards zero uh, that starts to get uh, indicate a weaker association, and then the the sign, the positive or negative sign on that is going to give us direction. So if it's positive, as x increases, y increases. As if it's a negative correlation, as x increases, y decreases. But yeah, I'm not going to give you a um, figure and say, oh, tell me what this core, uh, the strength of this correlation. It's not something we'll do. Other stuff. What chapter? Oh yeah, so so someone who whoever jumped in right before uh, Daniel. Can you go over ethics just a little bit because we're kind of rushed at the end. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a that's a. I think Brooke, that's a a very good, uh, a very good uh, thing to review. So talk about our ethical principles, right? And from a broad based sort of Belmont report, three basic ethical principles. This first one is going to be our respect for persons. So this is going to be respect for persons involves uh, our belief 
as ethical uh, researchers that individuals need to be uh, treated as independent autonomous agents. And if we're working with somebody who doesn't have, uh, has reduced capacity for independence, that we need to have a bunch of additional protections involved in that. Okay. So someone tell me, what are we, what's our major concern here in terms of research uh, 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 consideration with respect for persons? Do no harm. Okay. Do no harm is, that's, that's good. That's going to get us into, into beneficence. Uh, if I'm running a study, what's, what's the main thing I'm going to do in terms of respect for persons? Yeah, Daniel, go ahead and, and sort of expand on that. Uh, like making sure the individuals in the, in the study know exactly what they're uh, getting into. I guess they're given the information to make their own choice on whether or not to do it or not. Yeah, exactly. And w what's that document that we give to people to make sure that they know what they're getting themselves into? Informed consent. Yeah, exactly. So before you in uh, uh, participate in a study, you will with few exceptions, have some sort of informed consent, right? And that informed consent says, this is what we're studying, or this is uh, this is the study, uh, this is what it's gonna involve, uh, this is the time requirements for you, these are the activities, uh, these are the relative benefits, these are the relative risks to let you know exactly what's going on, okay? And so that informed consent piece is critical for uh, ethical research, right? If we think back to the uh, Tuskegee syphilis experiment, there was no informed consent in that. There was no respect for persons in that study. People were tricked into enrolling under the guise of free health care, but they were actually part of a research experiment where they were just following along and watching as uh, uh, this disease progressed and then actively keeping them from sort of seeking treatment, right? So uh, a huge, huge issue with respect for persons and a lot of other things, right? Um, but sometimes we're interested in studies and we're interested in populations that have, by definition, some sort of diminished level of autonomy. Uh, someone give me examples of, of groups of people who might have diminished autonomy. Prisoners. Prisoners, yep. Who else? I don't have any symptoms yet. Uh-oh. Oh, someone's, I think... <laughs> Got a side conversation of someone's uh, stuff. Okay, so prisoners, who else? Military personnel. Military personnel, yeah. What's, what's a big one or a little one? I guess you could think about it that way. Ch children, yeah. Yeah, so we got kids, we got kids, we have people who are impoverished and people with mental decline. So if we have someone with an intellectual disability or sort of perhaps older adults who uh, might not be able to make decisions on their own, um, uh, these are all people. If we want to do research with these individuals, we need to make sure that we have a lot of extra protections to make sure that they're not exploited, right? Um, and so... Uh, what this will often involve is some sort of assent process. So if I'm doing work with kids in schools, if I'm working with six-year-olds, six-year-olds don't have the power to grant legal consent to participate in studies, but I need to consult with their caregivers, uh, whoever uh, that is, their parents. And then what I'm probably going to do is going to have an assent process where I'm going to describe to the kids that I want to work with in developmentally appropriate language kind of what we're going to do and if they want to go through and participate. And what I want to do is have them say, yeah, no, that sounds good. I'll participate in that, right? Um, so one, our informed consent process and respect for persons. But then two, if our research involves people who by definition have lit limited autonomy, additional protections in place that we have to have uh, to make sure that we're not strong armoring, coercing, or tricking people into our partic in participating in our, in our studies, okay? So that's respect for person. Beneficence, beneficence is do no harm, okay? Uh, I need to be careful that my research isn't inadvertently causing people harm. Um, and if there are risks associated with my study, that I'm doing everything in my power to mitigate the potential negative effects of that, of that uh, research, okay? So for biomedical research and psychological research, um, if 
I have two different methods and one uh, involves a great level of risk and another involves sort of a much more manageable level of risk. risk. Which one of those things do I need to go with? The one with a much more manageable level of risk. And I say, oh, well, the one with the more manageable risk is sort of inconvenient and it's kind of expensive. I don't care. If we've got a clear distinction between here's a lot of risk for people who would be involved in this study and here's uh, a much less uh, risk, we need to go with the much less risk because of our uh, obligation for benef beneficence. Uh, other thing, though, is sometimes we're running studies and sometimes we're doing research uh, where we there's just risk involved, right? Um, you know, uh, there's just things that could go on or there are risks. If I'm doing uh, a study and I'm asking people, let's say, about uh, their personal history, something sensitive, uh, trauma history, sexual preferences, illegal activity or something along those lines, uh, the potential harm there is uh, disclosure of confidential information that could impact people's livelihoods, their relationships, things along those lines. And in that case, what I need to do, my study is not without risk, but what I need to do is I need to go through and make sure that I'm minimizing opportunities for uh, disclosure of confidential information, things along those lines. Okay. So it's not to say that we our uh, principle of beneficence doesn't say that we can't have any risk at all. It's just saying that we need to have things in place in order to make that the likelihood of those negative impacts as low as possible. Okay. So the last thing is justice. Okay. Uh, and justice is a tricky one. Justice involves uh, our requirement and our obligation to equally distribute benefits and burdens of research. Okay. And so a lot of times this ends up being uh, forcing us or making sure that we're thinking carefully about who we're including in the research and who's not including in the research, who the research is intended to help, um, and making sure that we have fair and equitable and uh, equitable inclusion. And so this can look a couple different ways. If I've got a, let's say, a high risk study, right? Um, what I need to do is make sure that I'm thinking about who's going to be participating in that study and are these the people who are actually going to help with this stuff, right? Because if not, it makes it not clear why I'm running a study in a group of individuals who the study will never ever help in order to sort of work some stuff out to help out somebody else, right? Um, or let's say I have something that has a lot of uh, great benefits to it, right? Um, let's say that I have a new cancer treatment. Um, and it's looking really good. But what I really do is I'm sort of worried about whether or not, you know, uh, diet or something like that. So there's stress impacts it. And so what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to include affluent people in my trial because maybe that I think that they're going to have less complications than people who may uh, struggle socioeconomically. Well, that's not fair because then we've just got uh, wealthy people who are uh, receiving all the potential benefit of my new therapeutic and the folks who... Um, maybe are in equal need, but I'm systematically excluding those individuals, we'd have an issue with justice there. So these are three big ethical principles. Um, does this, anybody have questions about kind of what's going on with these, with these big three here? Cool. Other questions? Uh, there were a couple of questions in chat. Mm. Hey, Daniel, I'm not monitoring the chat at all, but I should. Uh, let me see here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, okay, Riley. Yeah, uh, sorry about it. different types of biases. Uh, Riley, can you sort of pop in? Sort of give me a little bit more direction on this. Riley here. Okay. Well, uh, Riley might not be with us right now. I don't know. Oh, there's Riley. Okay. 
you got a mask on. Never mind. I see what you got going on there. No worries. Um, Riley, give me a thumbs up if uh, these are the types of biases you're you're we're referring to. Okay, there we go. Good. All right. So uh, different biases, and this is where we get into um, uh, into why we can't just you sort of use our common sense in order to try and sort of uh, understand things about uh, psychology. Different types of biases. So we, first, we've got our hindsight bias. Someone can someone give me an example of hindsight bias? Oh, beautiful. Matilda, I, I waited you out. You see what that was doing? There was me as a clinician. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with silence until you guys sort of break and then someone jumps in. I knew. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, the 2016 election, I think, was a great example of hindsight bias, right? Uh, we've got uh, had a situation where it looked like one candidate was going to blow the other candidate out of the water, right? Um, and if you talk to, and there was big fights even before the election about uh, different people who had different models and uh, some uh, people were upset because uh, some models they didn't think uh, had predicted the balance unequal enough. They're like, oh, you're just sort of saying it's close when it's actually not close. But then afterwards, when we had a result that was very, very different than what functionally everybody thought was going to happen. Then in hindsight, people were like, oh, well, of course this was going to happen. Yeah, you know, it was obvious that, you know, this was the the foregone result. Like everybody was a moron. They should have saw this. It's, it was going to happen. Well, that's easy to say on the back end, right? On the back end, once you already know the result, then it's easy to say, oh, yeah, that for sure this was what was going to happen, right? Um, but, uh looking back, right? And so again, uh, example I'll give to is uh, Hurricane Katrina, right? Afterwards, people are like, oh, of course, New Orleans was going to be underwater if this came through, right? Um, but at the time, you know, obviously, if we knew it was going to happen, sort of people would have sort of done something about it. It's easier to look back and then see things as being way more obvious than it was at the time, okay? So that's your hindsight bias. Overconfidence, we as humans tend to be much more confident in our level of accuracy, then we actually are accurate. Okay. Um, uh, what we tend to see is that people are very, very confident in the fact that they're right or sort of things along these lines. But when we actually look at how often people are right, it's sort of much, much less. Right. Um, so again, an example I had given is, you know, someone walks up, run, blows through an exam and like half the time of everybody else and say, okay, how'd you do? I blew it out of the water. Like I aced it, right? Oof, maybe, but maybe not, right? Also, uh, on the flip side, you tend to see that students are like, how did you do? I bombed it. Oh, I screwed this up so much. Actually did pretty well on it sometimes, you know? So, uh, but with overconfidence, what we're seeing is that, um, and again, give the example of uh, eyewitness testimony. How confident are you that you saw uh, this Masked man Riley G uh, is the person who perpetrated this crime. And I say uh, 100% certain that it was that person. Um, but it wasn't. It was Zoe. It was a different masked person who I sort of mistake for the other masked person, right? Um, but what I am is I'm overconfident in my level of confidence is much greater than my actual accuracy. Okay. Perceived order. This is going to be uh, when we see patterns that aren't really patterns, but we think they're patterns, right? Um, we're pretty good at, as human beings, at detecting sort of things that look like they're systematic in our environment. And this is probably good, probably helps us stay alive. But sometimes that can start to get out of control um, and we start to see things that aren't really there or we start to see uh, some systematic thing that it's actually not a thing. And so we see this a lot with um, uh, uh, superstitions, right? Well, if this happens, then this always happens. Like, well, it's just kind of a coincidence. World is filled with coincidences, right? This is my lucky number. As, as long as I have this thing with me, then everything goes right. Um, 
uh, well, maybe you had this thing with you and it, things went right a couple of times, but they were going to go right no matter what, whether or not you had your lucky coin or whatever going on. And so we tend to pick out uh, patterns when it's just random noise. Okay. Um, for example, let me see here. If I go... Okay, here's a random number generator. And I'm going to say... T -t 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 -t. Uh, say generate 100, uh, sort of 1 to 10. Okay, in five columns. All right. Maybe I'm going through and I'm saying, okay, I'm seeing you know, some sort of pattern in, in, in these data. Okay. So maybe I'm saying, Oh, look at these tens. Uh, we've got, if I've got this going, we've got, uh, one, two, two, one, two, I don't know. It's not really a pattern that sucks. All right. Oops. See if I can get something else that looks like a different pattern. Okay. So maybe I'm going through and I'm, uh, looking at these numbers and then all of a sudden I'm hitting 10, 10, 10, 10. There's no way through four tens could all come up in the same time, right? Um, this is, this is ridiculous, right? Uh, there's something going on here. Well, it's just an, uh, it's just a pattern, uh, or a random event. If we go one, two, we go heads, tails, right? Uh, let me see if I can find any streaks here. Ah, look at this. Yeah, look at that streak of twos, right? This is a random event, but I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I got fifteen twos, right? That's fifteen heads in a row. If someone's got a coin and they're flipping a coin, your friend's got a coin, and you flip a coin, and they hit fifteen heads in a row, how confident are you that they have a uh, fair coin? Exactly zero, right? But if we do it enough times, that stuff's going to happen, right? And so this is where uh, we start to see uh, patterns when there really aren't patterns. It's just random stuff going on. Okay. Uh, and then confirmation bias. We talked about this quite a bit uh, with some of the Freud stuff. Uh, this idea that uh, we tend to pull out information that's consistent with our beliefs and then we discount stuff that's not uh, that runs counter to our beliefs. This is a huge problem with humans in general um, because we're not objective uh, arbiters of information. If I believe um, that if I'm a if I'm a oppressor and I think uh, that all freshmen are clueless until they get into their second year of college till they figure things out. Um, and that's just the way things are, right? Am I much more likely to identify and notice behavior that's consistent with maybe a new freshman at university being sort of or unorganized or, uh, the freshmen who are out there killing it and, uh, uh, working through all their classes. It's the other stuff that I'm going to find, right? Or if I think about like, oh, uh, uh, college athletes don't take, uh, courses their coursework seriously and they're just sort of blowing things off right that's my belief i'm much more likely to notice or interpret behavior uh that's consistent with that belief than i am to say oh no i actually have uh, a lot of students who are just really really doing well and excelling in their academics in addition to sort of athletic stuff right so again uh this is uh, a big big reason why we get uh sort of uh sort of People stuck in conspiracy conspiracy theories, prejudices, things along these lines is, is this uh, confirmation bias stuff. Uh, and Riley, sort of, why do we uh, as humans look for patterns in our experiences? I don't know. Probably it's probably something that's adaptive. It probably helps us out, right? If I'm walking around the woods, right, in sort of pre civilization, if I start to notice that, hey, when I see these. Uh, sort of these claw marks on a tree that probably means that someone's not there or that I might be walking into something that could get me screwed up pretty well 
right? That's, that's keeping me alive, right? Seeing these patterns is something that probably historically has helped us sort of identify food, uh, keep from uh, uh, getting eaten and, and killed and things along those lines. So it's, it's not a bad thing necessarily. We just need to be aware that we're vulnerable to this. Okay, cool. Um, do we need to know, uh, Zoe, do we need to know women who influence psychology? Yeah, just sort of know general names. I mean, you don't have to know uh, birth dates or things along those lines, but just have a general recognition of, of who folks are and sort of what they did and things like that. These are all good questions. Other stuff. Uh, difference between critical thinking, scientific inquiry. So scientific inquiry, critical thinking is going to be just general overall, right? I can, Daniel, you can think critically about anything, right? Um, it's about sort of taking information and weighing things out, right? Critical thinking doesn't end good Lord, shouldn't be restricted to scientific thinking, right? It's just sort of our ability to go through and take information in, weigh it out, sort of understand strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that, right? Um, the scientific uh, uh, scientific method, scientific sort of principles, things like that, that's a more sort of uh, structured path for conducting research and sort of building on one another and things. So that's more of a, of a method. Critical thinking is more general, broad, uh, just as I go through my life, sort of some, I have someone who tells me, oh, hey, this thing happened. Like, well, I'm going to think about that person and think about the situation. I'm going to think critically about it and not just accept things for what they are uh, just because someone told me so. You should never accept anything just because it is because someone told you so, not me or anybody else, right? I sort of want to think critically about stuff. Other questions on any of this? This light's hitting me right in the eyeball here. Let me get better shades. Um, what chapters in our book do we need to read for the quiz? Okay, Nick, that's uh, in the syllabus. It's just going to be those first two modules. So just go through, check that syllabus, make sure that you've got uh those uh listed up in there and so you can pull up the syllabus in wild courses under the files or just the home page if you go scroll down to the bottom the whole uh uh, uh course schedule is is laid out there so just make sure it's going to be modules one and two um but as we move forward just go through and make sure that you've got that thank you yep Any other thoughts, questions, anything that I can uh, clarify, anything like that? Uh, for the quiz, is yep. it going to be on bio courses uh, when we're in their class tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. So, again, good question. I'll just get that set up. I've uh, about got... Uh, items finalized, what I'll do is I'll load that up as just a quiz in wild courses, and you can just go through, find that, click it, and then go through. Uh, remember that the quiz will be open from 11 to 11.50 during normal class time, so you just want to make sure that you're able to go through and get it. Don't have to worry about uh, um, lockdown browsers. Just go through, um, and again, you'll just want to make sure that you, because because of the, because it'll be a time quiz, same like the time quiz we have, sort of when we would normally be in session in class. Um, but I think sort of the trap people will fall in sometimes and say, oh, well, I'll just look up answers. Like mm, you can, but you'll run out of, you'll run out of time. So you want to make sure that you're walking into this tomorrow, uh, same as if you were walking into a quiz, an in-person quiz in a lecture hall, uh, if you do that, that's going to maximize uh, your opportunity to do well on this. Is it going to be over Zoom simultaneously, or is it just going to be? Nope, nope. It'll just be it'll just be uh, you just going through and running stuff. Yeah, I mean, the university has uh, 
honor lock things and, and proctoring and, and stuff like that, but it's way too much of a hassle for as many people as we have. It would, that would fail miserably if I tried to do that. So, um, we're not going to screw around with it. Anything else before I let you guys go? Really sure what I should like study the most. Yeah. Okay. Oh, anything's fair game. It's all fair game. Now, you know, if I had to, so I, I will say that, you know, 30 questions will come from lecture and will be things that we cover from lecture. The other 10 will come from the text. So, I mean, proportionally, I guess, maybe, but, but there's just so much overlap between the two. If you're really strong on the text, it's going to make you that much stronger on the lecture stuff. That'll tie together. Um, I mean, if I were you, if I was thinking, oh, so sort of this guy's going to give me uh, 10 questions that are from the text and not in lecture. There is stuff in the text that we didn't cover in lecture. I'd probably focus on that stuff, right? Um, uh, but what I wouldn't go through is, is just try and cherry pick stuff because knowing all the text material because of the overlap is just going to make you super strong on, on the, on the lecture stuff as well. So they kind of go hand in hand. What I will say, don't worry about dates. I mean, for this one, you'll need to know people's names because you need to know who's connected to what and what people are doing. Um, but you don't have to worry about, uh, say individual studies. I'm not going to say, uh, you know, Jolly at all 2019 said this, that's not a reasonable thing to ask you. Right. So focus on themes, uh, and sort of, sort of big picture stuff. Um, definitions, obviously go through and take a look at bolded terms and italicized terms. Uh, make sure that you know that, but again, uh, remember that, uh, you're going to be far better off in your studying, uh, working through examples and thinking about the application of this. Uh, because again, as I sort of, some of those questions I posted, you'll see, you know, they're, they're not definition questions. They're like, what's the definition of a correlation, right? It's going to be like, sort of, oh, X and Y did this and sort of blah, blah, blah. And then sort of you'll need to go through and do that. So um, the one thing I can say is, yeah, don't worry about dates or things along those lines or sort of individual studies. Okay. All right, folks. Well, um, I keep late hours. I'm up and particularly before exams and things like that, I'm uh, usually up working on, on stuff. So as you're going through, if you're having um, uh, questions or you're running into something, uh, feel free to uh, fire off an email and just let me know and I'll sort of get back to you and, and or try to get back to you and, and get that clarified. Um, uh, yep, go through and work through your notes and lectures and things along those lines. Um, and if you do that, you should be good to go. I mean, this is, we actually don't have too much material to cover this. It's just the, the two le uh, lecture slide decks and then the two uh, uh, modules. So hopefully this will sort of tie this together. Make sure you're strong on this. We'll get this first one out of the way and then, and then take it from there. Yeah. All right. So. Again, remember tomorrow uh, during regular class time at 11, make sure you're set up with a solid internet connection so you get, don't get dumped off or, or something along those lines. Um, uh, you just jump on, run through that. When you're done, you're done, and that'll be the end of things. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go through and once uh, things close down, figure out how to pull those down, get everything scored, and then what I'll do is I'll go through and post I'll post people's, uh, dang it, this is what I was, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, what I'm going to do on the on the front of this is scoring in our class is a little bit tough because it's uh, partly your uh, um, quiz scores, but then it's also going to be partly your research participation. Research participation is a huge, huge uh, uh, chunk of your, of your grade, and that's easy because that's just free money. You're just going to probably, because we're in the middle of COVID, there's not going to be much uh, in terms of in-person studies. It'll be getting online, completing surveys, some doing some stuff like that. Um, so you want to go through, you have six uh, hours to complete, plus you can do an additional three for extra credit. That's going to be a huge, huge buffer on uh, your scores. So but with the research credit, it starts to make it difficult to know kind of where you're at in the class. 
is because it really depends on how much research you finish by the end of the semester. So what I'll do is I'll ask for some sort of posting code at the front of the quiz. You go through, put that in, um, and then what I'll do is I'll post people's grades uh, behind your, your posting code. And then what you can do is you can find your posting code, take a look and see what your grade is, and that'll let you know how you did on the, on the quiz. Okay. All right. Cool. You guys, uh, good luck. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, we'll sort of be in touch after tomorrow's quiz. Sound good? All right, folks. We'll see you. Nice work.